When you go down to the bottle store and you see a wall of different whiskies, what makes one whisky different from another? Well, a big part is which cask it's aged in. You know, some whiskies aged in ex bourbon casks, ex sherry casks, but a lot of whiskies these days are now being aged in ex wine casks. And I really believe if you want to know more about whiskey, if you want to know what you're buying when you go to the store, you need to know about wine casks. So that's what I'm talking about today. It's wine basics for whiskey lovers. And make sure you watch to the end because throughout this video, I'm going to be recommending some fantastic wine cask matured whiskies that I think you should buy. Now before I talk about all the different wine types and casks that are used with whiskey, let's recap and go back to why casks are so important with whiskey. As most of you know, most whiskey around the world needs to be aged in wood for a minimum of two years. And with scotch, that's actually three years and it has to be aged in oak. But the thing is, most distillers aren't that keen to age their whiskey in fresh oak cask that's brand new because when you put your spirit in a fresh new cask, the oak can be pretty intense or like impart each of these real tanniny and bitter flavors. So most distilleries prefer to age their whiskey in a cask that's had a previous liquid in it. First of all, it will bear the brunt of the tanniny flavors. It will take a lot of those tanniny flavors out and it will replace it with its own unique flavors. So Feels like when I first got into whiskey, wine casks were reserved for like single cask or some special release. These days, not so much. Wine cask matured whiskies are now part of so many distilleries' core range, and it's just becoming more and more common. But why is that? There is a cask shortage for one, and so they're looking for alternative sources for casks. Casks are becoming more extremely expensive, and so they're looking to tequila casks and wine casks but also just provide something different to the consumer, a different flavor profile and uh, to experiment. So that's Eric, he's a fellow YouTuber. He makes fantastic videos about whiskey, but he also has a background in wine. I'm a certified sommelier with the Court of Mass Sommeliers. A French wine scholar, the Wine Scholar Guild. I have a diploma from the Winesburg Educational Trust and a degree in enology. I was in wine for about 20 years before I got into whiskey back in 2016. And uh, since then, uh, I've stood with the Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. And so do you think overall wine casks work with whiskey? From what I've tried, yes. Remember, they're not pouring wine into it, that it's not supposed to. They're just extracting leftovers and remnants out of a cask. It, this is the same if sherry cask or pour, as long as it doesn't taste like someone just took a, a fortified wine and just dumped it into the whiskey, then yeah, it's just another option to have. And so it's just a red fruit nuance you're bringing to the spirit rather than totally masking and overriding uh, the character. A lot of people are skeptical about red wine and whiskey, and I think rightfully so. Like if you put sherry into a glass of whiskey, it'd probably still be drinkable, but if you put red wine into a glass of whiskey, you know, it will be hit and miss. Distillers are figuring out what works. So a lot of you watching this channel, you probably know a little bit about whiskey, you own a few bottles of whiskey, but you might not know too much about wine. So let's talk about what wine is and how it's made and stuff. So basically to recap with whiskey is your fermenting grain, which is sometimes called distiller's beer. So you're basically making beer and then you distill it. With wine, it's fermented grape juice. So what's happening is the yeast is eating all the sugars from the grape juice and then it's pooping out alcohol and then you end up getting a drink that's sort of 12 to 15% alcohol. So there's two main ways that wine is normally categorized. The first is which grape is used. So there's hundreds and hundreds of different grapes that can be used within wine, which will give you a huge spectrum of flavors. And the other is the region. So the region is much more commonly used on bottles which are from old world countries. So in wine, it's typically separated into two groups. There's old world wines, which are kind of from old European countries, Spain, Italy, France, Germany, and in new world countries, countries which have kind of been making wine only kind of in the last century. In new worlds such as the United States or New Zealand, Australia, Chile, your wine's going to be named after the grape. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec. However, in France, most of France, the wine's can be named after the region and what grapes go into depend on the regulations but also depending on the weather for that particular year. 
So wine is not aged in casks for as long as whiskey is aged in casks. With wine it's generally like 6 months to about 24 months unless it's fortified wine. After it's been used a few times after about 5 years, the wood's not really doing a lot more to the wine. So basically it ends up being a really good trade because the wineries can then sell their casks that are not really doing a lot to the whiskey industry. And with whiskey, because it's a higher ABV product, it will inherit a lot of these flavors still from the wood and from the wine. When we do see whiskey aged in wine casks, why are we most likely to see whiskies finished in a wine cask rather than having its entire maturation in a wine cask? Everything is about a matter of balance. It's very easy to override the character of the spirit. If you put it 100% virgin oak, it's gonna override the character of the spirit. If you put it 100% in a wine cask, it's really gonna taste like maybe somebody took whiskey and put it into a wine. Why don't you wanna to just totally drown your food in pepper? or totally drown it in salt. So let's jump in to some of the most popular wine and wine casks used within whiskey that you should definitely know. I think rather than going through each wine specifically is to talk about the bigger categories that are used within wine cask matured whiskey. And I think if you know these five categories, you'll pretty much understand 99% of all wine cask matured whiskies. So they're gonna be your fortified wines, your sweet wines, your white wines, and your red wines. The first big group of wines you should know are the fortified wine. And these are the ones that you've probably already tried whiskey aged in because this is actually where sherry fits in. Fortification is the adding of a neutral spirit to stop the fermentation and add alcohol. Traditionally, this was for the transportation of wine. Think back to the days of wooden ships. How is that wine on a wooden ship gonna make its way from the island of Madeira or Portugal or here in Spain to make it away up to Great Britain? How is it gonna be stable and make that trip? Add some neutral grain spirit to it to get the ABV up that it stabilizes it as well as once you then open the wine, um, it doesn't go bad uh, right away. Fortified wines, the most popular, most common style is sherry, come from the Harris region. Historically, that's because of the relationship with the UK, with uh, Spain, when they weren't getting along so well with the French. Now, when you're drinking whiskey, 99% of the time, it's Oloroso Sherry. And it's gonna give you a classic flavors of dried fruit, nutty, and spice flavors. The other really common sherry you'll often see is PX. This is like a very sweet sherry. They make it in a way that's like, they dry the grapes out. There's also a bunch of other sherries. Uh, there's even dry sherries, but I did a whole video on this and I definitely think you should go over there and watch that. I go into much more depth. But there are other sherry styles of wines from around the world that can't be called sherry because sherry, like champagne, like scotch, is bound to a location. Uh, one is Apera in Australia. So if you see an Australian whiskey aged in Apera cask, just think in your mind, this is the Australian version of sherry. The next fortified wine you should know is port. And it's similar to sherry, but it's not from Spain, it's from Portugal. And there's two main types of port. There is the tawny port and the ruby port. So ruby port, it's much more ruby in color, will give you much more berry flavors and fruity flavors and often be a lot younger. Whereas tawny port's often aged for a lot longer, will give you more nutty flavors, caramel flavors. Like this one here, I've got a long row, and you can see it's aged in tawny port cask. This is becoming more and more common, seeing whiskies aged in port casks. So the other fortified wine you should know is Madeira. Madeira is actually also from Portugal, but it's from the Madeira Islands. And I'd say compared to say Ruby and Tawny Port, it's probably more similar to the Tawny Port. That's because like it shares some of those like nutty flavors. But I would say Madeira is a lot more like caramelized generally. And I think this is because of the way Madeira is made. Madeira was sort of made by accident. A lot of things in the wine and whiskey world was Oops, something happened and hey, what do you know? We kind of like this. Trying to transport wines from Portugal up to Great Britain and it's getting rocked on a ship and it's getting heated up. And what happened is it gets sort of a toasted character to it. And I would say also overall among whiskey geeks and whiskey enthusiasts I've talked to, this is fast becoming the favorite wine cask to mature whiskey. The last one for wine you'll probably see around, but probably is not as much as the others, well that I've seen anyway, is Masala from Sicily in Italy. And this is kind of similar to the rest. It's a fortified wine. The key thing I find different with Masala is that I get a bit more of like a stewed apricot 
flavor, but I mean, there's a big spectrum to this as well. They're okay, but um, I, I'm much more impressed by a nice Madeira, a nice sherry wine than I am for our Marsala. Let's move on to our still wines and our table wines. But before we talk about like our dry white wines and our heavy red wines, I first want to talk about the sweet wines, just because within whiskey cask maturation, this is super, super common. And it's because with a sweet wine, the residual sugar will impart really well to a cask, then be imparted onto a whiskey really well. And so whiskey distillers love sweet wines to mature their whiskey. Both your fortified wines are sweet and your Petritus wines are sweet and your straw wines are all sweet, but it's the production uh, method which is made that really makes it the difference to it. Uh, it's, it's what the style of uh, wine it is. There's some common ones, German sweet Riesling, there's Hungry Takai. The one you really see a lot of though is from this tiny little sub-region of a region which is called Sauterne in Bordeaux in France. It has this really interesting process of making Sauterne. Basically they encourage it to get attacked by this kind of fungus called a noble rot. Botrytis cinerea, this is sound a little gross, is a little mold that comes in with the fog and infects the grapes, sucks the moisture out, and what you have left behind is a little bit of juice that has a very intense sweetness. One of the whiskies that made it kind of very popular was the Glenmorangie Nectar Door. But these days, a lot of people are reaching for this one here, the Aaron Sauterne cast. Sauterne really imparts a lot of like these tropical notes, these honey notes. But there's others like uh, Peter whiskies that are now aged in Sauterne cast. Like I've got a Port Charlotte, this is the SC01 2012. But this was sent to me by a Patreon. If you guys want to join me on Patreon, support videos like this, these deep dives, click the link in the description. Fantastic stuff. And I can see why Sauterne is becoming so popular within whiskey. So the next big wine group you should know are the white wines. And this is the one you probably already definitely know about because it's in every supermarket, it's in every bar. I think it's the most popular type of wine in the world. And generally it's from a yellow to greeny grapes and it's gonna give you sort of a light yellow to a golden color. So generally speaking, white wines, they're not aged on skin. You don't wanna get any tannins off the skin. They tend to be generally stainless steel fermented and then maybe depending on what kind of grape it is, they're gonna be Asian oak. There's so many wine types, I can't really generalize, but generally among the dry white wines, you're gonna get flavors like citrus notes and you're gonna get like white fruit notes. And some of your like typical most famous uh, white grapes are gonna be your Chardonnay, your Sauvignon Blanc, your Pinot Gris. Here actually is a Chardonnay cask, it's a Glen Murray. And you can see uh, on it, it says Chardonnay cask finish. So that's gonna give you those citrus, those white fruit notes, some of those buttery notes you specifically will get from a Chardonnay. What I do find with white wine casks is it's a much more subtle influence than say from red wine, from sweet wine and from fortified wine. It's almost a little bit more like the ex-bourbon cask. It lets the spirit speak a little louder. And now to everyone's favorite style of wine and it is the red wine. Red wines are generally from the darker variety of grapes and it's gonna give wines sort of a spectrum of colors from like a violet purple to a brick to even like a brown for the much more older red wines. Red wines uh, are gonna be fermented uh, on skins so that you get a red juice before you even start uh, fermentation. Generally speaking, most red wines spend some time in oak. So let's start with Pinot Noir. Um, it's generally one of your like lighter red wines. And it's a very, very popular and famous style of wine, mainly if because of Burgundy, which is arguably probably the most famous wine region in the world. I did visit there quite a few years ago. We did a tour around there and some of the most expensive wines in the world are also from Burgundy. And in Burgundy, they have two grapes, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So for the red wine, they use Pinot Noir. But Pinot Noir is found around the world now. Uh, like New Zealand has a massive Pinot Noir scene in Central Otago. This is Ardbeg Black, committee release, came out a few years ago. Uh, finished in a Pinot Noir cast from New Zealand. Pinot Noir is a very finicky grape, very thin skinned. It does best in cooler climates on particular soils. Okay, so now let's move on to the bolder reds. And one of the most famous ones now is Rioja, uh, also known as Rioja, I think you can pronounce it both ways. So Rioja is actually a region within Spain. Rioja. 
Europa is the very north of Spain, is we are with the border with the Basque Country. But that's not the primary grape. The primary grape is actually Tempranillo. So I actually have a bottle here and you can see there it's written Rioja, below it is Tempranillo. Tempranillo is that grape. It's going to give you some really nice like spice flavors, red fruit and some like earthy flavors too. Because of the climate in Rioja and Roberto de Duero, it tends to be more baked strawberries. So think of strawberry jam. But what I think it really works well for with whiskey is Peated whiskey. The one that lots of whiskey YouTubers have been going on about at the moment is this one here, the Lechag Sinclair series. I can see why so many people love it because it adds this really unique, bright spice note to the whiskey. You don't get in other Lechags and even other whiskies. So the next red wine you should definitely know about are the red wines from Bordeaux. And Bordeaux is a super famous wine region within France. Now we've already talked about Soltoun and Soltoun technically is a Bordeaux too, but it's kind of the exception to the rule. I think when most people think of Bordeaux, they're thinking of the red wines. And what's interesting is that it's kind of like whiskey in some ways, like with single malts and blended whiskies. There actually are types of wines which are a blend of different grapes rather than just a single grape. And Bordeaux is a fantastic example where most of the wines are a blend of quite a few grapes like Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec. Some have a little bit of Carmenere, but I think the two main grapes you really need to know, these are the ones you need to remember, are Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And what's really interesting is that there's kind of a geographic divide between the two styles. Generally speaking, you get more Cabernet Sauvignon on the left bank and you get more Merlot on the right bank. Cabernet Sauvignon, higher tannin. You're gonna get more black currant, blackberry. Merlot is much more approachable. There's a distillery out there which has been really great for exploring the different types of Bordeaux just within the region. So this one here I've talked about a lot before. So it's the Port Charlotte POC. This is from Poyac, which is a sub-region within Murdoch, which is a sub-region on the left bank. So long story short, this is going to be more Cabernet Sauvignon Fort. Again, one of my patrons, Nick Keen, he sent me a sample of his Port Charlotte, the PMC, which is from the right bank, from Pomerau, which is more Merlot Ford. So it's going to be a little bit lighter fruits and that sort of thing. Another red wine that's kind of rising up at the moment, a lot of distilleries are now catching on to this, is the Amarona. A really famous example is this one here, the Aran Amarona. So Amarona's a wine from Italy. The way they make the wine is they dry the grapes, similar to PX. But unlike PX, it's not fortified and it's definitely not as sweet. Then we have what's called straw mat wines. That's in which you take the grapes, you put them out on straw mats to let them dry and they shrivel up. So some other reds just quickly are Brollo or Barbaresco. These are both from Piemonte in Italy. This is my absolute favorite style of wine from Italy. And it's in a beautiful region. It's like little hills and they're backdropped by these beautiful mountains. I actually visited here. Absolutely fantastic place to do a road trip around if you ever go there. And these wines are real hearty. You can age them for like 30 years. Some other uh, red wines you might come across, Syrah or Raz, it's the same thing, just depends which country and like what they call it. But to be honest, I think we've kind of covered most of the wines that are used to mature whiskey. There are some other ones though, like Rosé, which is kind of in between red and white. And then you've got like your sparkling wines, like Champagne. Just quickly, Champagne has very strict regulations on the word Champagne. There actually are whiskies out there aged in eggs Champagne casks, but they can't call it an eggs Champagne cask whiskey. And so often they'll say something like Cuvée, or they'll say barrique cask matured. So I think if you've seen words like that, maybe reach out to your distillery on Instagram, whatever, tell them I sent you, and then, you know, get a little bit more specific information because they're probably not allowed to say it on the bottle what sort of cask it actually is. Overall, I'm very positive about whiskey being aged in wine casks. And I think some distilleries have shown us they can do it really well. And look at the different grape varieties that are starting to work. They were starting to work out, do work with whiskey, like Rioja, Madeira, and Sauterne. The thing is, there are so many wine types. Like my favorite wine is a Carmenere, but I've never seen a whiskey aged in a Carmenere cask. So we don't even know, maybe it does work, maybe it doesn't. But I'm all for exploring. I don't want a bunch of like, distilleries around the world that are just scotch copycats all aging their whiskey and ex-bourbon casks and all kind of tasting pretty similar. I think it's fantastic when world whiskies can explore their backyard and use casks from their backyard from wines that are made there too. I think it just really adds to the terroir, the story and just making something a little bit more unique. I'm keen to hear what you guys think. I'm keen to hear what your favorite 
whiskies that are aged in wine casks are. And if you like this deep dive sort of types of video, these do take a while to make. Do jump over to Patreon. It's where you can support the channel. And there's also bonus content over there. I do a bunch of Q&As where you can ask me any question you want. And um, every so often I'll release a Q&A video. But above all though, make sure you share and enjoy.